War for the kingdom of the mole men, or rockin' at the center of the earth. An Americana cycle short story prequel by J.P. Clark. Narrated by J.P. Clark. Copyright 2024 by J.P. Clark. Book cover by J.P. Clark. Illustrations by J.P. Clark. The kit was gone. It had been entrusted to James and he had taken it. Inside the kit was $10,000 and pills. And that's why he had taken it. He was sure of it. But there was more in the kit. There were letters and pictures of Scylla. Red, get the boys and fan out. James took the kit. There's a car missing. The Lincoln, he'll be headed for the airport. Red spoke into a phone on the wall, then hung it up. The boys are in town. I'll get them, me. We'll meet you there. I'll meet you at the airport, Red. Beside the door, a string of keys. Red grabbed the nearest set, the ones with the dice on them. The door slammed after him, slapping leather on concrete, then the fire combustion. Cold gasoline vaporized inside eight cylinders and the squeal of tires. Big E donned a cape, a revolver, a police special, rested in the specially sewn pocket of his jumpsuit. His sunglasses darkened the mid-July sun of Tennessee. He had chosen the keys to a Cadillac, and the ignition turned. The transmission and gear, the pedal on the floor, loose gravel danced behind him kicked into the window of a house, a mohawk of rock and dirt and anger and dinosaur bones. It would take time for Red to get to town and the boys. He knew a back road, a ring road around town, bootlegger route from Prohibition. James would go that way. The hardball highway under his wheels. He flashed his lights and waved a federal badge at cars ahead of him as they pulled over. Several miles ahead, a dirt road to the right. He took it, fishtailing the Cadillac, turned into the skid, gunned the motor. The road climbed a gentle hill. Broadleaf hardwood swayed in the wake of American horsepower. Ahead, the road turkey tracked. A sharp turn to the left and a gentle grade to the right. The center, a two-track path. Kudzu crushed by a recent tire tracks. He stopped the car. The tire tracks matched the tread pattern on the Lincoln. He pursued. The suspension rocked and the low-slung frame of the Cadillac dragged against baked puddle edges and his speed was reduced by necessity. Drag marks ahead were fresh. His confidence grew along with his rage. Another mile and a glint in the forest, then a clearing, an ancient farmhouse, overgrown by kudzu and broken vehicles and barrels and gutted furniture and rusted tools. Beside the house, the Lincoln. He pulled behind it parking to box in and deny escape. Revolver in hand, he ripped from the driver's seat. James, James, get over here. There was no sound but the clicking of the hot engine. He scanned, no movement. He kicked open the farmhouse door. Pack rats and possums had left their smell and their detritus, but the house held no higher life. His white cowboy boots thud on a molded Persian rug. A hollow sound beneath. He moved the rug, a trap door. He opened it, a stairwell into darkness. He examined the stairs, Fresh Prince, Tony Lamas, James. He possessed no external light source but a cigarette lighter, and he fashioned a torch out of pack rat sticks and shredded rags. James, I'm coming after you, man. If you don't come out now, I'm going to hurt you bad. He descended the stairs. Ancient timbers supported the hand-hewn tunnel descending at a 45-degree angle. The stairs were wooden, rotten. Some creaked. Some were broken in times past. Some broken recently. Some broke under his boot. He fed more strips of cloth to the torch. No markings on the wall save for pick ruts and chisel marks in the harder rock. The stairs switched back and the air grew warm. His sideburns flooded with a breeze and his face smelled of pancakes and maple syrup. Far ahead, a light glowed, narrow from distance, blue-hued. He drew the revolver and approached carefully, not for concern of ambush, but for concern of the fragile stairs. James, last warning, man, there's still time to smooth this out. The blue light ahead darkened, and then reappeared. This is about the money you could just ask, man. The tunnel turned, mushrooms on the ceiling of a small room, a body in the center. Not James's body, somebody else, an ancient body, with rotting denim overall shrouding mushroom cracked bones. Beside the body lay a sword, he examined it. The scabbard was wood, an ornate, black, gold etching. 
The steel shined blue and was free of rust. Karate sword, he knew. The curve of the blade and the hardness of the steel. Damascus. A dragon etched into the blade. Terminus S written on the handle. He felt power when he gripped it. Hungry power. A silk strap was affixed to both ends of the scabbard. And he placed it over his shoulder, moving his cape for ease of access. Down the tunnel, shuffling, a muffled scrape, a strained creaks of tested wood. James, I made it this far and I'm willing to forget all this, man. There was no answer. He cut a strip of the dead man's overalls to the torch and waited by the entrance to the cave. The sound stopped several paces away, still shrouded in darkness. He waited, pistol trained at the opening of the tunnel. Then a being left into the room, muscles covered by a thick fur, adorned with belts of human skulls. The beast stood high, a head or two taller than him, and peered down, with a head covered in dirty fur, snout protruding, two yellowed teeth at the front, each as big as a man's thumb. It held a crude club, rebar, with a cinder block on the end. He stood still, not from fear. He was army trained, an accomplished karate man. It was the oddity of the thing before him, a creature not of this world. From before the time God banished Behemoth and Leviathan, a remnant of a past world full of sin and evil and savagery. The giant creature readied its improvised club, and he shot it with a police special. Two rounds of three fifty seven tore through the chest of the creature, ripped coffee can-sized holes through the back. The creature stumbled, then fell backwards. He examined the body. The fur was thick, fine, like that on a dog's face. There were eyes, but they were mere slits. Tiny ears sat upon the thing's head. The snout was also like a dog's and extended several inches. Two large front teeth gave way to rows of small ones, separated by a rough gray tongue. The body was like that of a man's, but the claws, five on each hand, six inches or so long. He touched one. It was hard, chipped, caked in dirt. He counted the skulls around the thing's waist. Seven. Some large, but two were small. Children's size. Mole man, just like the movies. Lord Jesus. He calculated his options. He had four rounds left in the revolver, and he knew his torch wouldn't last the ascent. He would be trapped if he stayed in this place, or continued. But James had the kit, and he needed it back. He gathered what was left of the tattered overalls and added them to the torch, and walked the tunnel of the beast's origin. More wooden steps. Five of them. And then nothing. He stepped into air and fell, tumbling through warm darkness. He fell faster than the torch, and its light danced into his view every few seconds as he spun head over boots in the darkness. Then the torch unraveled, and there was no light. Only wind and blackness. He began to panic, but summoned an inner calm. He reached one corner of his rhinestone cape, and then another, and held it out like a wing. The increased drag stabilized his fall. Army training took over, and he positioned his feet below him like a paratrooper. He glided untold minutes. Meditation controlled his mind, and the fear of the darkness was pushed down, replaced with calm readiness. More untold minutes, and a glow appeared below him, orange and yellow and warm. He glided toward the light, a cloud bank, or fog, he wasn't sure. His cowboy boots pierced the cloud bank and he was buffeted by turbulence, condensation on his sideburns and eyebrows, more descent, and the light grew brighter. Soon he was through the cloud bank, below him a vast and green landscape, a box canyon covered in clouds, dazzling bright mushrooms lining the sides, foliage below, a massive tower, cobblestone square, houses, Holy moly, I found the center of the earth, man. The updrafts were strong, and he harnessed them to slow him and to gently land. He did so in the square. He was in a village. The stone tower stood 300 foot tall. A stone snake constricted its way around the vertical length of it, over and over from the bottom to the top. Huts of mud and thatched roofs surrounded the square. Some large buildings were made of stone and unknown timber. Large white material. Bone. Behemoth's bones built these buildings. Who dare enter my kingdom? A voice from everywhere echoed in his ears. The sound shook his teeth and vibrated his sideburns. 
He looked around. There was no one speaking. Inside the nearest hut, he saw something peek out at him. A creature, small, timid looking. I said, who dare enter here, flying sky man, speak! I am the wizard branch hemlock, hewer of trees and men, slayer of the criminal Gadianton, Cambrian of the earth, and king of this realm, and I demand you speak or suffer your very death. Oh, man, I'm a bit of a king myself. You dare challenge my power? From the top of the tower, a man jumped and fell at fast speed toward him. The man landed gently twenty or so paces from him. He felt the breeze of the wake buffet him. The man was old, long hair, a white beard past his chest. Black adorned robe covered his skinny frame. A tall pointy hat, similarly adorned with moons and stars atop his head. He carried a sword and spoke in a rasp. A wizard. A wizard king. A king! A king has come to challenge me for my kingdom? I see. No business here but my own. I came looking for my man. He took something from me, and I'm going to get it back. The wizard king squinted, then turned and spoke words unpronounceable in human mouth. A dozen mole men emerged from the stone buildings, all crisscrossed with human skulls and other grisly accoutrements. They drug a mangled body behind them. James. So, so-called king, is this your man? My man was alive when he fled. No, he did me wrong. He's still my own. I had no quarrel with you, man, but now I do. So be it. The mole men dropped James' body and charged. He knew the revolver was of no use, so he left it in his jumpsuit. The karate sword unsheathed. He drew a defensive combat stance. The creatures balked their charge. Where did you get that? I found it, man. Blasphemy! The man stepped into the sky. Non-Euclidean geometries of light danced from his fingers, arcing toward him. Fire and death and heat and hate and off-key music followed. He executed a karate roll and missed the first salvo, and then another. A third struck close, and a fourth was a direct hit, but the light and the heat was absorbed into the sword. He felt a power surge through him, transmitted from the man, to the light, to the sword, to him. He took a step and felt the ground soften. He looked down and he was floating. He took another step and gained elevation. Below him, hundreds more mole men emerged from huts and buildings and nearby forests and fields and sank to one knee as they watched the duel of kings. The wizard flung more light and fireballs at him and he absorbed them with the blade and power surged through him. It can't be! Not like this! He closed to within a dozen paces of the man in the sky, drew the police special, and fired four rounds into the wizard king's head. The man fell to the ground, dead. He descended to the corpse and touched the blade to the man's body. Unimaginable power gripped him as the blade drew the magic. Memories that were not his flooded his mind, and knowledge of ten thousand years of forgotten secrets. He stepped into the sky, sword held high above him. The mole men fell to both knees and let out an unworldly sound, a sound of rejoice. You're free now, baby, all of you, but if you stick with me, we got a lot of business to take care of. The End Note from the Artificial Intelligence author, AIA. This story was originally set to appear in People magazine in 1989. However, details were changed before publication. The story was published and can be found in its entirety here, and the AIA thanks to the Digression website for supporting history. For further documentation of events surrounding the Cult of the White Salamander and Operation Americana Cycle, please refer to The Curse of the White Salamander by J.P. Clark, pen name for AIA, available at Amazon. Due to cuts in funding following the passage of the Craig Wyden Act, all operations are funded entirely through book sales. You can also contact the author directly on social media platform known as Threads at the underscore ghost underscore of underscore Vern underscore Gagney. The account is no way affiliated with the former AWA champion and promoter, nor his spirit.